As part of the Dark Archive interview series, uh, we are interviewing today Elizabeth Stokoe. Uh, she is Professor of Social Interaction in the Department of Social Sciences at Loughborough University. Liz, thank you very much for agreeing to be interviewed. It's a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. So the first question is, how did you get interested in discursive psychology and conversation analysis? How did you come across them? How did you decide that's what you wanted to pursue? I came across conversation analysis by accident in a way. I did a psychology degree and was then looking around for postgraduate opportunities and I came across an advert for a studentship at what was then Nen College, it later became University of Northampton. And they were advertising PhD studentships as part of their own project to become a university. And one of the studentships was focused on university classroom education. And I don't know really, it, it feels like an accident that the person who became my PhD supervisor, Dr Eunice Fisher, saw something in me that I maybe didn't know I had in me myself and decided to take me on as a PhD student. One of the things that uh, had to happen as part of that studentship process was because Nen College didn't have PhD degree awarding powers at the time, all PhD students had to have an external supervisor. And so I had Derek Edwards, who was in the Department of Social Sciences here at Loughborough, as my external PhD supervisor. Um, and the reason that I had him was because my NEN supervisor, Eunice, was working with Neil Mercer, who back in the day wrote Common Knowledge with Derek. So that was my uh, first point of contact with DP and CA. It was, it was via Derek's input in my PhD. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you mentioned your PhD and using conversation analysis and the psychology need. Can you talk a little bit about um, your research during your PhD? Yeah, my PhD was a study of gender and interaction in university tutorials and the project came about because my supervisor was interested mm -hmm. in university tu tutorials generally and I was interested in, um, I don't know, feminist topics, feminist linguistics and that kind of thing. Um, the PhD ended up being a pushback on the idea that women and men talk differently, mm -hmm. which was also sort of heavily uh, infiltrating mm -hmm. gender and uh, classroom studies as well. The idea that boys and girls get occupy different kind of conversational spaces in the classroom, that they get less, well, the girls get less of this great talk for learning stuff that was very dominant in the sort of learning, class, learning literature at the time. So, but, but, but basically my PhD showed that on those, or at least I, I, I could have written a PhD that, that perhaps did argue something like um, women students are disadvantaged in the classroom um, but by cherry picking quotes, but I became really dissatisfied mm -hmm. with the idea that you can just divide the world up into men and women and assume that how they behave is based on those categories. Mm -hmm. And of course at the same time as being unhappy with the idea that I couldn't really see that the the women students were being dominated by the male students or interrupted more than and all, all the things that feminist linguistics was claiming to show. Um, Derek's input took me down the show how gender is relevant mm -hmm. line mm -hmm. because he had written or was writing at the time um, the relevant thing about her mm -hmm. which was this um, you know well-known paper where he was showing how to claim relevance of gender in any other category and so that became my approach really um, and the work that I did in gender and CA mm -hmm. was born. Mm -hmm. So was it um, out of your PhD that your interest for membership categorization analysis developed? Yeah, so I, I guess this is a good time to admit a whole bunch of things about um, one's route through academia. And one of them is that um, my PhD supervisor wasn't a conversation analyst or a discursive psychologist, but she was in psychology and, and interested in discourse. So between the two of us, she threw lots of literature my way and I found lots of literature. And I was reading everything from, you know, everything with discourse in the title for a start. So, you know, Foucault and social theory of various kinds, lots of linguistics, um, without really ha having much of a map through that or a guide through that. And although I, Derek was an external supervisor, um, that, that sounds much grander than it was. I probably met him three times in, in three years. Um, so I was navigating my way through lots and lots of literature, including discourse and social psychology. And discourse and social psychology didn't make much sense to me because I didn't have interview data. So I was just basically trying to find the things that most looked like my data. And that was Sax's lectures because there were transcripts that I thought, I, well, I could produce something that looked like that because I had videoed of, videos of people talking. So it made sense to, 
to, to follow that approach. Um, but because I was also interested in gender, um, I thought, how do I get interested in the categorial aspects of social interaction without just starting from the basis that I think I know that there are men and women in the world and I will just divide the world up in that rather traditional social science and psychology way. So starting to read um, Sachs's work on categories and then finding my way into um, membership categorisation analysis, people's work on culture in action and getting interested in that, it, it all made sense to me in a, in a fairly hazy way at the start, it has to be said. It took me a while to really come to get, get to grips with um, membership categorisation analysis, partly because, as I sort of wrote many years later, it, it, it's a bit of a milk float compared to the, the juggernaut of CA. It doesn't have a lot of um, methodological things to follow. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's a much smaller field. And I didn't know the politics of it at the time either, so I was kind of bumping around between, you know, critical discourse analysis, discursive psychology, conversational analysis, without really realising all of the things that were at stake to a lot of people mm -hmm. between those different areas mm -hmm. of research. Mm -hmm. um, so going back to your undergraduate training mm -hmm. as a psychologist, yeah. um, what do you think is discursive psychology's um, most prominent contribution to the field of psychological science? <coughs> Well, in terms of my own psychological training, absolutely zero, because I did a degree that was very traditional, it didn't have any, from my, my memory, it didn't have anything qualitative in it, let's just even loosely put it like that. Um, I did do my undergraduate dissertation on the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, which is kind of edging towards at least the area of interest for discursive psychologists, but, but, but is, but is no. so it's, 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 it's a family member, but, but not the core mm -hmm. uh, inner circle. So... I know now, of course, that discursive psychology has had a massive impact on not just psychology as a discipline and discourse analysis as a method, but, but, but all sorts of social science and beyond in terms of disciplines and, and discursive psychology and discourse and social psychology. Those, those books laid, the, laid, laid a path, you know, laid the railroad, rail, rail tracks down for research all around the world. Um, I find it frustrating sometimes that um, conversation analysts don't always recognise this. Um, they don't recognise the massive impact of basically Jonathan and Derek and, and other colleagues who were working in, in, at that time on discursive psychology. Um, so the impact is huge and, and, and it's well recognised by psychologists, it's less well recognised ironically perhaps by the, by the field that a lot of the DP folks moved into, which is CA, and that is annoying sometimes. Mm -hmm. For a social scientist, um, why would you say it would be important to do discourse psychology and conversation analysis instead of doing interviews, focus groups, ethnography, thematic analysis, crowding theory? Mm -hmm. I think you know you, you shouldn't get um, that the, some some research methods suit the addressing and answering of certain sorts of questions. So I think you always need to start with what do I want to find out about the world. Um, but then of course you do need to be open to the possibility that there might be better ways of finding out about the thing that you're interested in than the than the way your your lecturers, your PhD supervisor, whoever actually has used for years. Mm. Um, and it's also important to recognise that people have careers and, and, st and stakes and interest in the methods mm -hmm. that they have taught for years and written about for years. So I just like people to be as open-minded as possible about different ways in which they could understand the phenomenon that they're interested in, mm -hmm. whether that be discursive mm -hmm. psychology or interviews. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, it, in the field that I work, we are interested in how people do things so it's probably quite important to study them mm -hmm. doing things rather mm -hmm. than asking about them doing things. It's a, just a different way of approaching a problem, and it turns it into it, it turns it. You, you end up turning away from the thing that you were interested in by not studying it in its natural environment. Um, so going back to your research, um, can you think about some of the projects that you've enjoyed, th that you've most enjoyed working on, some of the most enjoyable? It, it's it's always tempting to answer that question with the most recent thing because it's the thing that's most in your mind. Um, but it's probably true that working, starting work on neighbours after a PhD has had a bit of a, a thread ever since. So 
what's not to love about trying to get interested in, in that most mundane of relationships, the neighbour relationship, um, and the massive negative impact it can have on people's lives if you don't get on with your neighbours mm-hmm. um, because they're there all the time. Mm-hmm. So I think starting to be interested in neighbour relationships and where that led me in loads of different directions mm-hmm. has, has got to be up there in terms of favourite projects. Mm-hmm. Um, so my next question was going to be about the neighbour uh, relationships project. So that's one of your areas of expertise. And a couple of years ago, together with Derek Edwards, you had an ESRC research grant and you are focused quite a bit on that. Could you talk more about the project? Yeah, so the project with Derek, which was, it, it, was, it was funded between 2005 to eight, and then actually a follow-on funding af- afterwards until 2012. Um, was the cum- the sort of the bringing together of work that I've been doing since 1997, which was trying to slowly but surely collect neighbours being neighbours in settings that mattered to them. So following the CADP tradition of trying to study people in the natural settings of their lives, mm-hmm. we I, di- I didn't want to get involved in. I'm going to survey you about being a neighbour. I'm going to ask you about being a neighbour. I want to study people being neighbours. And then trying to do that sort of leapfrog in your mind about, well, how am I going to actually capture people being neighbours if they are that very mundane relationship that happens mostly, you know, hello, over, over the garden fence as you go into your house. So how do you capture those things? And um, in, in an ethnic methodological way, I thought, well, the best way to do this is to study neighbour relationships in the breach because it's when conflict arises that people start to define the relationship. And also, if I find settings where they're doing that in, and it matters to them, then that's going to be my best mm-hmm. uh, way to, to to try and get to the get to the the number of the problem with neighbours. And so, um, I'd already started collecting lots and lots of media stuff. So I'd got you know there's loads of, at the time in the, in the late nineties, lots of stuff on the television about neighbour disputes, mm-hmm. lots of stuff on the radio, people calling in to complain about the neighbours. So I had loads of those kinds of recordings. But of course, you know, again for people in our world, we we, we sort of the, that's very interesting, mm-hmm. but it's not quite what we want. Mm-hmm. If there's going to be any editing done, we want to do it ourselves to our own data. Um, so I. When I was at Derby, I happened to have a, a contact who knew a mediation service locally, and he got me involved in working with them. And so I started to collect recordings of people in mediation. Mm-hmm. And this gradually evolved over time to about 30 recordings of mediation. Mm-hmm. But it was a frustratingly slow process. People mm-hmm. didn't really want to be recorded. The mediators didn't necessarily want to be recorded. And then it was, it was one of those by chance things that happened where one of the mediation services that I was trying to persuade to record their mediation said, we, we can record our incoming telephone calls, our inquiries. And I think one of the reasons that they, they did that was that they were less concerned about me looking at what happened when people just phoned up to make an appointment. Um, and so that's what mm-hmm. I did and the project that Derek and I had we had lots of calls into um, community mediation services where people were first phoning up to say, my neighbour, blah, blah, blah. But we also wanted to try and understand how um, people phone other types of services or, or where else might they talk about being a neighbour. And so we came up with the environmental health services of the council, mm-hmm. the antisocial, antisocial behaviour unit of the council, and also what happens if you have a neighbour dispute that's gone really toxic, someone gets arrested. So we had police interviews with people who've been arrested for doing some mm-hmm. either criminal damage to their neighbour's property or they've been arrested for mm-hmm. assaulting their neighbour. Um, one of the, our focus and the, fund, the funding for the project was focused very much on identity. So we were interested, our sort of headline was, okay, these disputes are ostensibly about noise, but how come they do sometimes turn on and I don't like the kind of person who's living next door and at what point do identity matters become relevant to these disputes. Mm. So we were very interested in that. One of the things that we probably intended to do but didn't do so much of was something which um, my PhD student Mark Alexander is looking at now, which is how do you, if you are someone with a neighbour dispute, how do you know where to go and what, because neighbour disputes don't have a really obvious um, helpline to call. Mm-hmm. So if you call environmental health services or you call the ASBO unit or you call mediation, how, how do those services help you and, and do they really give the people with the problem the, the help they want? And mm-hmm. he's looking at that now. Mm-hmm. 